Hello, I'm Yair Aitzma, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. For generations, a tidal area in Hood Canal has been a farm. That all changed one recent day when a big yellow machine took down the dike that has held back the salt water and the process then started of turning this area back to its natural state. So the site was once an estuary. Uh, the landowners used it for agriculture, but in order to keep the salt water out, they dug a ditch and built a dike to control the salt water. Fish populations used the estuary. As soon as the, the dikes were erected, the uh, fish were excluded. The land was no longer usable by fish, although it was good for cattle. Well, the, the project today is actually the, the final removal of the dike. There's been a, a large amount of preparation preparing the ground for that day when we can remove the dike, removing roads, removing infrastructure. But today, the, the dike is coming out, and the salt water will flood the site again. Uh, the site's been leveled and for the purposes of agriculture. And so when the tide comes in and goes out that twice a day uh, tidal cycle, a lot of water is going to be moving in and out of this site, and that water is going to be salty. So we're going to see a change in the vegetation. We're going to see uh, channels forming over time. And then again, the fish can access the site, and the site will be more fully connected to the estuary and Hood Canal. So it's the beginning of a whole food chain. The, the estuary. Uh, produces organic matter. That organic matter feeds a large number of organisms. And then uh, down the food chain, you have everything uh, from uh, shrimp to shellfish to, to the birds of prey that will uh, feed on the whole system. Uh, there's going to be a lot of monitoring to see how fast it recovers, to see if all our decisions in, during design uh, were as good as we hoped they are. And, uh, and then we'll see this process unfold probably quickly at first, and then it will slow down and see gradual recovery over several decades. But I think we're going to see some immediate benefit in terms of uh, uh, vegetation colonizing the site and the channel starting to form definitely within the decade. Well, the catwalk was produced because the site already has multiple uses. The Tacoma Public Utility uh, has uh, transmission lines across the site. And as a condition for doing the project, we needed to maintain access to those transmission lines. This site is only 100 acres. And uh, it's one of many sites. That the trick with estuaries, there's only so many places on the landscape you can have an estuary. And so in order to restore this kind of habitat that benefits fish so much, uh, we can only really do that effectively in places where estuaries once were. So this project is really the beginning of a, a process of figuring out how we can restore some of the functions of our estuaries that we have lost uh, through some of this agricultural conversion. There are a number of projects uh, beyond the Skokomish across Puget Sound and the Snohomish Estuary and the Skagit Estuary and the Nisqually Estuary, looking at ways that we can uh, reconstruct, recreate some of these historical habitats that have so many benefits for the species we trust or care about. I think that the folks locally are hoping that they can help develop the local economy of this place by creating opportunities for bird watching and other outdoor activities. Hatcheries are playing a role in restoring some of our endangered salmon runs. That effort is constantly being tested, like this day in the Wenatchee Basin. The objective of all the supplementation programs in the Wenatchee Basin and throughout the Upper Columbia is to supplement the, naturally, uh, the natural runs of salmon and steelhead. The supplementation programs have been operating since 1989, and this study is one of the more um, intensive studies that are currently ongoing throughout the Columbia Basin. Supplementation programs are designed to supplement um, the natural runs and eventually bring those runs up to sustainable levels so that we can have plenty of fish in the future available for um, harvest and for future generations. We're examining one of the main critical assumptions involved in supplementation, and that is, do hatchery fish that are progeny of wild broodstock, do those fish produce offspring at a similar rate as wild fish that have not been brought into the hatchery? And if that is the case, then the supplementation programs will eventually meet their objectives 
assuming that other uh, limiting factors are also addressed. Um, hatchery programs are just one of the tools that the department and the other co-managers use to help increase the survival and increase the abundance and productivity of these stocks. What we try to do on the spawning grounds is 100% of the Spring Chinook at Tumwater Dam are, are pit tagged. Pit tag is a small micro trip tag similar to what's used in people's pets or cattle. And all these fish are pit tagged and what we try to do is once a female uh, salmon has is spawned out and is simply just guarding her red, the nest, we try to carefully sneak up on those fish and record the pit tag number of that individual. Um, once that is done, then we take a lot more series of measurements on the red itself, on the salmon nest, and we want to make sure that we can compare how wild salmon and hatchery salmon are constructing their nests. And some of those factors may be important in their subsequent survival. So we look at the velocity and the depth and how deep the red is created and how big the nest is, and we compare those data for hatchery fish to, to wild fish. Here are some fishing opportunities for the coming weeks. The promotion of a film, a restaurant chain, and a WDFW biologist came together to spread the word about the importance of wetlands to our wildlife. What you're about to see you might think is unusual. However, Ken Bevis isn't your ordinary sort of guy. We tied the imaginary world of far, far away to the real wetland by emphasizing the four parts of any wetland, water, soil, plants, animals, what people get out of it in the very, very solid technical demonstration of filtration. And the kids went through each station and did hands-on exercises to basically experience a little bit about that. Of particular note was how interested they were in all the little bugs and things that came from just simply a scoop of muck from uh, two different wetlands. And there were leeches and amphipods and other little things swimming around in the algae. They really liked it. And we had some large natural history specimens here to link to animals and soil to kind of give them a sense of soil. They liked things that they could touch and they liked things that they could see moving. I think it was, I think it was good. Then we tied them all together with the web of life exercise where you take a string and then you have the water and then the soil and then the plants and the animals and essentially it demonstrates the web of life. And then when you start letting things go, it falls apart. And then when you try to recreate it, it's never quite the same. So it's a real graphic visualization of uh, ecology. So yeah, so we were trying to link that to this opportunity because we had their attention. I'm, I'm a habitat biologist that works in all kinds of different habitats, including wetlands. Even though environmental education is not in my immediate job description, I think every chance we get to communicate with people about the value of habitats and species, we should take it. Um, I like to do it, and 
I do it every chance I get. So I think it's an important part of our job. It's not explicit, but we should do it, and we need to do more of it. The particular challenge of this thing, too, was we couldn't go outside to an actual wetland, so we had to bring the wetland to them. And so uh, my car is really full of a lot of stuff. I think it's important that the Department of Fish and Wildlife recognize that outreach is critical if we're going to make much progress in the future. Young people, uh, adults, everybody, and we have to work at crafting our message to each different group given whatever opportunity. So when we have an opportunity, then we should take it. And here I am. I didn't want to pass this up. Are you sure you don't live in a swamp? Is this a wetland way? I live in a swamp. <laughs> Now for something completely different. You won't believe this. You can believe that Washington offers great hunting and wildlife viewing opportunities. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can save Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching.